Hi, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am Scott Dr. Jake Skolfein, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guide of Funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be so glad you did. It's just cover to cover full of insights and reviews of the best funk of all time. Makes a great gift. Appreciate the support. And isn't it amazing that this is always right here so handy for me to just share with you. Whether you're watching to um, our YouTube broadcast or from funkinstuff.net, or listening to the audio podcast version on iTunes or from other leading providers like Stitcher and many others, I thank you as always so much for your continued interest and support in this program. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe. Subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube. That's F-U-N-K-N-S-T-U-F-F. And it's a channel on YouTube as well as a website at .net. But um, you subscribe on YouTube and you'll never miss any new information on Truth and Rhythm or Truth and Rhythm Quick Takes. You also get shows before anyone else does with early premieres. And, um, you know, there's almost 100 shows now. So don't miss out. Subscribe. Tell friends. Tell family. Love the support. My guest today is bassist, singer, composer, Mark Canoli, who you may not know by name, but if you're a fan of late 1970s funk and R&B, you have surely grooved to his playing. You see, he was legendary producer Norman Whitfield's studio ace, one of them anyway, during the peak of the former Temptation Masterminds record label run under the Whitfield Records moniker. From 1978 through 1982, the acts Canoli recorded with included Rose Royce, Stargard, The Undisputed Truth, Willie Hutch, Jr. Walker, Masterpiece, Otis Day and the Nights, Spider Turner, and Canoli's own band, Mama Tappy. Just some of the hits from that period include what you waiting for, which way is up, love don't live here anymore, showtime, funkin' around, and bad mother funker. Cannoli sometimes worked around the clock with musicians like James Gatson, Wawa Watson, Michael Nash, and Victor Nix, Joe Harris, and Trey Stone, all the while picking up insights and wisdom from the masterful Whitfield. In this deep excursion, Cannoli shares his musical roots and family. Tells how he came into Whitfield's favor as a trusted studio partner. Opens the book with stories about the height of Whitfield Records, especially the songs and the magic. He recounts unforgettable memories about the production giant. He reveals how that world came crumbling down in the early 1980s. He also discusses how faith saw him through. And finally, he talks about his life today and the acts that he presently works with. By now, you may be saying, Scott, what you waiting for? Let's get to it. You know, I would say that you're right. It's showtime. Enjoy. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm show bassist Mark Canoli, best known for his work with Rose Royce, one of the most successful funk R&B bands of the 1970s and 1980s, as well as being a key player for legendary producer Norman Whitfield's stable of acts. Mark, how are you today? I'm good, Scott. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being halved. <laughs> so you're coming to us uh, from where today? From Cannoli Music Studios in Santa Clara, California, which is a, a suburb just west of San Jose, California. Oh, nice area. Yeah. yeah. It's and originally from where? Well, originally I'm from a city called Coffeyville, Kansas, a little town just about 27 miles north of the Oklahoma border. But then when I was uh, eight years old, my family moved to Oakland, California. And so I consider myself raised in Oakland. Ah, and Santa Clarita, for those who don't know, uh, home of the 49ers now. So, uh, I'm sure you're conflicted between uh, your allegiance to uh, the Raiders and, and the 49ers being so close. 
Um, yeah, I am. The the my 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 team always will be the Oakland Raiders. I like the Niners, but you know, it, I, I root for the Raiders every year until like the fourth or fifth week when they're out of it, <laughs> and then I start rooting for other people. Well, you know, I'm a lifelong a Dallas Cowboys fan. As you can probably see there's back there. Um, but uh, oh, yeah. thank you so much for Amari Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a good trade for you guys, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. And of course, uh, Raiders going to Las Vegas pretty soon. So, yeah, I'm one of those people who were like, I was against the move to Las Vegas in the beginning until I saw the proposal of the stadium that Las Vegas wants to build. And I thought, oh my goodness. This is one of the most storied franchises in the league. It's got the most rabid fan base. Their fan base is all over the world. And they're still playing in the same old raggedy stadium that they were playing in in the 1960s. They're the only team in sports that's still playing in the same stadium that they played in 50 years ago. So I, I was like, yeah, let's let's. I'm okay with Las Vegas if they're going to build a stadium like that because Oakland and Alameda County can't seem to pull it off. So I'm I'm I'll be okay with them in Las Vegas. I'll still be a Raider lover. <laughs> I was just in Vegas last month, and their that stadium's coming together fast, very fast. You so. got to see it building. You got to see it coming up. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I think they're ahead of schedule. So oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, hopefully you'll get out there and get a chance to see him there sometime. Yeah. And now we got the Raiders leaving. I mean, I'm not the Raiders. We got the Warriors leaving Oakland now, too. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> well, another another uh, uh, connection I have with you, in a way, is uh, Steph Curry. Davidson is uh, right next door to uh, my town here. So I okay. went to games there, and they have a great program. So. I was a fan of his from college, so we have that connection going. Even though I have the LA Lakers. Yeah, have Lakers. <laughs> I'm sorry about the Lakers this year. Okay. I used to be. A, I was a huge Laker fan when Magic was there. Huge Laker fan. Showtime, baby. Yeah, man. <laughs> well, talking Lakers is where uh, it tells me we need to move back to music. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I, I told you off air, but big fan, uh, Mark, of, you know, the music that you helped create, um, such great stuff in the late 70s, and I can't wait to uh, get deeper into it with you. So, again, thanks for coming on. Thank you. My honor. So, you know, uh, before we get into all that stuff, uh, we know where you're from, where you grew up, but how did you first get into music, and, and when did you get into music? Well... I got into music uh, really when I got into it was in high school, but my family and uh, and I came from kind of a big family. My mom had six boys and all of us could sing or play or do something. And uh, uh, I, I didn't get serious about music until maybe my, sophomore, junior year in high school. And uh, um, we happened to live in a neighborhood on 72nd uh, off of East 14th in between East 14th and Oral, shout out to 72nd and Oral, that was uh, loaded with both athletes and musicians. And when I was in high school, there were two groups and I, I never didn't know who this neighbor was, but he lived exactly like across the street from me, just one house over. And there was a group called the Whispers that used to rehearse there. Now, I don't know what he played. I think he played maybe keyboards or bass or something like that. But the Whispers used to rehearse there. And then when I went into high school, the Pointer Sisters used to rehearse in the same house. And we'd be all sitting around the house listening to these guys rehearsing. Um, we being all the kids in the neighborhood, this neighborhood was 
was loaded with a bunch of kids. Um, I happened to live, um, I happened to be the, my house happened to be the center spot, the center spot um, for a bunch of uh, just gorgeous young girls that lived to the left, to the right of me, and directly across the street and around the corner and, and down the house. And shout out to the Marshall family and their five, five girls, the Jackson family on the right of me and their three girls, the McDonald family to the left of me and their three girls, and the Boatwright family, like seven or eight houses down, they had nine girls. So with all these girls in the neighborhood, all the guys used to come hang out on my front porch for blocks around. So any time of the day from my, say like my ninth grade to maybe my 12th grade, there'd always, there'd always be 15, 16, 17 young boys, uh, teenage boys hanging out on my front porch. And some of us were musicians. So the house right on the corner was Michael and Kevin Hurt's house. And uh, Michael was the first one in the neighborhood who was serious about music, right? Uh, he was the first one. So he used to get together. He, he and his little brother, Kevin, used to get together with me and my little brother, Craig. And we used to go in the garage and jam. And we put together a little high school, you know, garage jam band. And and that's really that's really where it started for me, Um and it just kept elevating, just kept elevating from there. I started off, uh, you know, doing that at about, about, about 15, 16. And by the time I was like 19, I was playing music full time. <laughs> and was, was bass the first thing that you gravitated to? Actually, um, ba uh, guitar was the first thing that I gravitated to, right? We had put together this band, this high school band called the Funk Masters Unlimited, right? And uh, we had like three guitar players, a bass player, a drummer, a keyboard player. And uh, and we were just all into the, you know, um, the meters and, and cooling the gang and uh, you know, earth, wind, and fire, tower power, stuff like that. But, but, but really, we weren't very good. And we had a we had a bass player, bless his heart. This kid, you know, so so we're a ghetto. We're a bunch of ghetto kids, basically. And but we had this one family who would get their son anything he wanted. Craig Clayton, his family would get him anything he wanted. So he got. He's the first one. He had a real bass and a real amp. Everybody else had. And now I see it as junk that we got from wherever we got it from. Somebody gave it to us or we got it from a pawn shop or whatever. But Craig's family actually bought him a bass guitar and an amp and, uh, and you know, and a PA system so that we could keep us off the street, keep his sons, keep their son off the street and and we we'd have something to do because you know a bunch of teenage kids running around, uh, you know, in a urban neighborhood, uh, you, they have to have stuff to do, or they find trouble. And so I'm so grateful to both Craig Clayton's family, uh, the Clayton family, and also to Michael Hurt's family because Michael's Michael's mother and father let us all come up in her garage and just jam. And we were just making noise at that time. But it was, uh, we had uh, three guitar players. I was one of the guitar players. It was Larry Simpson, Otis Burns, and myself. And we would, we would rehearse. I remember we rehearsed on Thursday nights. And every single Thursday for about seven or eight weeks, we spent the whole rehearsal with me trying to teach Craig Clayton how to execute and teach the teach him how to play the bass lines, right? So I'm I'm 15 to 16, and I'm trying to teach Craig how to play his own bass, right? And one week, one week after he heard rehearsal, Otis Burns, I'll never forget him. He's a funky guitar player. Today he's a funky guitar player out of Oakland. 
Otis Burns called me, called us together, said, man, every week, every week, we do the same thing. We spend the whole rehearsal with you trying to teach Craig how to play his bass. He said, man, won't you just play bass? And I was like, oh, I never thought about that. <laughs> so I switched to bass and never left. Been playing at bass ever since. One month, one month after I switched to bass, I played my first recording session. Somebody asked me to come. There was a there was a uh, a record company in Berkeley called Fantasy Records, yeah. and um, at that time uh, they had a they had a producer on that label named Jesse Owens. Had the same name as the uh, as the Olympic runner. His name was Jesse Owens. And Jesse had asked me to play bass on a song that he brought in a couple of other friends uh, on to play on. And so I played my first session after only playing bass, like literally one month. And it was my first time ever in the studio. And I remember thinking, this is what I want to do. I want to do this for the rest of my life. I want to make music. This is this. Is, and I made that that quality decision and never never looked back. Mm -hmm. Well, um, how did Jesse come to uh, you know hear you play or see you or have that connection happen? Jesse, uh, there were there were another there was another guitar player and a drummer uh, who I had been jamming with beside the beside the funk masters uh, at that time. Uh, I had ended up playing in like uh, not just the Funk Masters was the band I put together, and then my reputation started growing around town, and I found myself playing with five different groups, but uh, only only one of them was actually, or uh, only two of them were actually doing anything, playing any gigs, right? And uh, one of the groups I played in was called Gypsy, and the, uh, Jesse heard. Uh, it was Maurice and and Ray. I can't remember their last names, but Ray was a drummer. Maurice was a guitar player, and uh, and they were older than me. They were significantly older than me. They were probably in their thirties at the time. I was about fifteen, sixteen, about sixteen, and um, and he had heard them play and asked them to come in the studio to play on the song. And he asked them, did they know a bass player? And they say, yeah, we got this this bad young cat who can come do this, and that's how I that's how I got in on it. You know, Jesse Jesse uh, uh they they asked me through Jesse. I mean, they asked me for Jesse, and I went in the studio, and I guess Jesse liked me because uh, as far as I as far as I know, he kept the tracks. I don't know if anything ever happened to the song, but I remember it was the most fun I'd ever had at that time in my life. Like I said, I was only about 16 years old at the time. Did, did you ever have any formal lessons? I never had any formal lessons. I, um, God bless me with a great ear. I've always been able to just, I've always been able to just hear the music and just figure out what to play or figure out how to execute it. And, uh, and the crazy thing is here it is like 55 years later, 50 years later, not 55, 50, 51 years later. And I still do that. I still, I, re, I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a better reader now than I was then, but it, I'm self-taught all the way around. And I still rely on what I hear. The one thing that I learned how to do is to make the music feel good. I learned that real early. If it doesn't feel good, it ain't good. So I know how to play a groove to make the music feel good. And that's that's uh, pretty much has got me by most of my whole career. You know how to find that pocket. I learned how to find the pocket. Yeah. You know? And that and that was my influence. My my early influences were James Brown, Tower Power, Sly and the Family Stone. You know, in those days, I knew everything that any of those acts had put out at the time. And I just learned how to play it, learned how to execute it. And it, it was it was very cool. I was <laughs> going to ask you, Mark, in particular, you know, being in that part of the country, 
know, how much of an influence were local heroes like Sly or Tower of Power, you know, uh, two of the three you mentioned were from there. They were huge. They were huge. They're, they're still, um, you know, they're still influence. I, I still follow them, you know, to this day. And, and right now in my studio, one of the things I do, not only do I record people's music, but I, I teach. I teach voice and I teach uh, bass guitar. And uh, when I teach bass guitar, uh, I start with the same thing that influenced me, teaching these kids how to make the music feel good. You know, how to, how to you know, find out what the key is, lock into that key, listen to the drum beat, and then play along with the drum beat and find those spots, find those, those places to make it pocket, you know. And uh, so, yeah, I, I still teach them and I've got some good bass students also. We know uh, I've had Greg, uh, uh, Rico on the show. Oh and, yeah, uh, and uh, next week I'm doing uh, Emilio from Tower of Power. So oh my guys, my heroes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, you're a teenager, and uh, you're you're already recording in, in big time studios. How did you uh, end up, you know, crossing paths or or becoming known uh, in in the um, Norman Whitfield world? Okay. So I'm, I'm a, um, I told you I have brothers that were also musicians and all of them were good. Well, my older brother, Ron Cannoli, um, at the time he was a secular artist in, in uh, he's, he's 10 years older than me. So he was in LA and he was, uh, he was gigging in LA and he was an um, amazing singer, just an amazing baritone singer. And he was gigging in LA and um, he had gotten sick. Uh, this was in 1974. He had gotten sick and was hospitalized. And my mother flew down to LA to visit with him, help out while he was in the hospital. And she came back after a couple of weeks and she said, Mark, Ron really needs some help. Would you consider going down to LA? and?" playing with him and helping him out until he got better. And, you know, just go down and do whatever you can. And I said, sure, mom, I do that. So I, I went to LA and I got connected with my brother. Now, what I didn't know was how big my brother was in LA. Back in the, in the seventies, there was a radio station in LA called KGFJ, mm -hmm. right? Soul I, I grew up with it, yeah. You remember KGFJ? Yeah. They used to 1230. have. Yeah, 1238. Yeah, uh, 1230 AM. Yep. Yeah. They used to have a contest, like a talent contest called a KGFJ Soul Search. And the first prize for it was a record deal, right? For winning this KGFJ Soul Search. Well, my brother won it two years in a row, 69 and 70. And when I got down there, my brother kind of had a reputation around LA as just this killer front man with this velvety baritone voice, right? He was really good. So anyway, I didn't, I didn't know all that because I was in Oakland, I was still in high school. I went about, but this time I was out of high school, I was in college. Uh, and, but I flew down there to see my brother. I knew my brother had had a hit song a couple of years earlier, but, that was really about it. I was, you know, high schooler, you're into your own life. You're, you're into your own world, your own life. I was trying to play football for San Francisco State, and I was, you know, playing with the Green Brothers Band, and and just, you know, I was into what I was doing. I was, I had finally got out of the house and and just doing things that were, you know, that were not supervised by my mom, you know for the first time in my life. And, and, and it was kind of cool. And then she asked me to go to LA. So I went to LA and, uh, and, and got down there. And um, when my brother got out of hospital, I stayed down there for a few weeks. And when my brother got out of the hospital, he took me around to uh, the different clubs and, uh, and places that he had sang in. And uh, uh, every, pla every place we went, I'll never forget this. Every place we went, 
everybody was excited about him being in the house and they always asked him to sit in and sing a song with the band, whoever the band was. And he always said, yeah, but he said, yeah, but uh, but I want you to let my, my baby brother play bass. Uh, they didn't, they were okay with that, right? So we, so he and, he and I would sit in and we'd play, uh, we, he'd sing a song and usually, he, in those days he was doing a lot of Al Green and I knew all the Al Green songs. And, and then, uh, then he, he'd let me, he'd have me sing a song. And the song that I always sang was, uh, was Tower of Power, What Is Hip? But, and what was crazy was that I could play bass on that song and sing it at the same time and sing it well. And uh, um, so, um, so um, one night we're coming home from one of those gigs and you know how big brothers have a tendency to influence. My big brother told me I was a professional. I was like, what? He said, man, you don't know how good you are, do you? I'm saying, well, what do you mean? He says, man, no bass player can play bass like, like you and sing at the same time. I was like, oh, really? You know, like I'm at this time, I'm 19 years old, right? And I'm like, and 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 I'm I'm thinking I'm 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 okay. I'm thinking I'm just an okay bass player. But my brother convinced me that I needed to come down to LA and put together a band with him. And uh, and he had won. He had, this was during the time he had won the KGF J, J, J Soul Search, and he was looking for that deal that they, that this radio station was going to sponsor. And he had signed a deal with RCA Records, right? And in fact, he'd signed a he'd signed a management deal with uh, John Flores. John Flores was the guy who. Uh, who produced the Hughes Corporation? They had the song "Rock the Boat, Don't Rock the Boat, Baby, Rock the Boat." Remember what you wonder, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that guy had signed my brother to our, to the uh, RCA label, and Ron wanted me in his band, right? And of course, I'm like, I'm 19 years old. I'm like, I'm blown away. So that that's how I got to LA. I, I, I came back to Oakland, dropped out of school, went back to L.A. Me and my brother put together a band. Uh, several years later, about about uh, let's see, that was seven, four, about about um, t actually two years. So, whew, not quite two years later, one of those bands that we had set in with, the leader of that band called me from Canada and said he needed a bass player. He was coming back to Orange County in um, <laughs> uh, November 22nd. He was coming back to Orange County and he needed a new bass player and he wanted me to play bass uh, in his band. The band was called Bump City. The lead singer was a guy named Walter Downing. Now Walter Downing is the uncle of the jazz guy, Will Downing. Like, you know who Will mm -hmm. Downing is? Yeah, Walter is the uncle of the jazz, and Walter was an amazing, amazing organ player and singer, and a, um, um, just a mighty, just a strong front man. And so uh, the group was called Bump City, and uh, they came back from uh, from Canada and they set up the audition. My first day of audition turned out to be my first day in the band, and so Trump. Uh, uh, Bump, so I joined Bump City. I know this is a long way getting to the. That's cool. Details are good, man. I I can't believe you remember the exact date of November twenty second. Oh man, that was, those are life changing dates in my life. Um, I went on the road with Bump City, and boy, were we good. It was a really, really just a monster band, Bump City, and we toured all up and down the West Coast from from LA uh, all the way up to to uh, Washington. And then we then we went into Canada and we did a, a extensive amount of time in Canada. I had never been out of the country at that point. It was my first time going to a foreign country. We went to uh, uh, Regina, Saskatoon, Edmonton, 
and um, Vancouver. And then we came back and just, just all up and down the West Coast. We, we just stayed booked, stayed gigging. Mostly it was, it was uh, nightclubs, dance clubs at this, those times. This was like 70, um, 75, 76, 77. And um, mostly cover tunes. Mostly cover stuff, but Bump City was so good. We did a we did a few uh, originals, not too many, but we did a few originals. Especially when we got Trey Stone in the band. Trey Stone was a guitar player. Trey Stone is a guitar player who played with with uh, uh, Undisputed Truth and he played with Bootsy's Rubber Band. And Trey joined the band, and uh, and we got into more originals stuff. So um, anyway, um, the way that what happened what what happened was the guy the guitar player who quit uh, quit because he got the gig with the undisputed truth. Now this is a this is where this this is where the story gets complex. The guitar player who was in Bump City quit Bump City because he got the gig with the Undisputed Truth, with Joe Harris and those guys, right? And they went out on a tour in, um, it must have been, it must have been 76, the late part of 76, where they, it, it didn't go well. Lots of, uh, everything that happened, I don't even know what all happened, but I know it didn't go well and they had a lot of dates left that they had committed to. And Norman called the group back and fired everybody and kept the guitar player. His name was Izzy Martin. And Izzy, uh, Izzy was the only one who was communicating with Norman, telling them, telling him what these guys were doing on the road. And they, it was, you know, it was just your basic bunch of young fools out there. They were all talented, but they were just being young and crazy and wild. And they they got into a lot of trouble. So Norman called him in. And because he still had dates on the calendar, he decided to let Izzy put together a new band to go out and be the undisputed truth to finish this tour that they had dates committed to. Right. So Izzy didn't know any any player stronger than Bump City. So Izzy called Walter. Walter gathered the band. We all came down, we auditioned to be the Undisputed Truth. We did We did one gig as the Undisputed Truth at the Whiskey A Go-Go in 1977. Norman came and saw us, well, he booked the gig actually, but he, he saw us that night and we tore the roof off the place. And Norman decided that night, he said, listen, uh, I want you guys to be a new group. I, I don't want y'all to be the truth. You guys got something, your own thing going that's really strong. So I'm going to sign you guys as a brand new act. And as a result, he signed us as Mamatappy. So Bump City, the whole band, became Mamatappy, right? Where'd that name come from? He came up with that name. He he said, nah, I'm going to get a little vulgar if it's okay. That's no problem. All right. He said, the first time he saw us on stage, what he said to himself, now this is what he told us in a meeting when we were talking about names for the group. He said, the first time I saw you guys on stage, I said, damn, these dudes are a motherfucker. That was his exact word. That's what he said. But of course, can't say that, but you know, so he, he thought he was trying to think of, you know, what's a, what's a nice way to say that? Right. And he came up with he, he said that in the east in the East Coast, they used to say they used to say Mama Jamma or Mama Tappy. That's a bad Mama Tappy when you wanted to say a bad mother MF. But, you know, you you can't say that. So you say, well, that's a bad Mama Tappy. And that's they and, and we all thought about it and decided, yeah, that's the name we want. If that's the impression you got of us. That's the name we want. So we, we he signed us as an act called Mammatap. So the West Coast group got an East Coast name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
we abandoned Bump City and got got an East Coast name, and that's how that's how we got in there. So at this point, we hadn't played any sessions yet for Norman, right? But Norman had an engineer named Leonard Jackson. Leonard was a good kid. Leonard had had done was doing some sessions on his own at a different studio. He was he was he was one of Norman's primary engineers at Whitfield Records, but he was doing stuff on his own time outside. And he had called me he had called me in to play bass on one of his songs, and uh, and um, so I went to do a session for Leonard, and you know. I, I played my butt off. It was it was pretty good. I, it was a real good session. It was a good session for me. Leonard was really happy with my work, right? And so, um, so what happened was when Norman signed us, he told us that we couldn't go out and gig anymore. We can't go do bars and nightclubs, and we can't go tour. And he said, "You guys are gonna be big stars. Y'all can't do this anymore. Y'all have to wait till your own record comes out." So the whole band went from gigging every night to just sitting around waiting, right? And of course, the record the the record industry moves at a snail's pace, right? So we're sitting around waiting for Norman to do something with us. Leonard used me in a session, and then after that, I decided, well, heck, I'm gonna just start hanging out um, since I can't go gig anymore, and that's what I've been doing. Since I moved to LA, uh, I'm just gonna go hang out at the studio. Just hang out and see what I can learn. Maybe I can learn something, right? So I'm hanging out at the studio, and I'm seeing uh, I'm in there with you know with the Funk Brothers. You know, just I'm just hanging out, and they're gigging. Where was right. the studio located? The studio in LA. This was uh, uh, we 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 they recorded at that time. Um, they were recording in uh, three main studios. They were recording at the uh, Amigo Studios, which was Warner Brothers, one of Warner Brothers recording studios. They recorded at a place called One Step Up on Wilshire, uh, not Wilshire, on on, uh, um, on on Melrose Boulevard. God, I remember this. It's been... <laughs> Oh, and then they recorded at this place called the, the Hit Factory, right? And there's a nice story behind the Hit Factory. Uh, I'll tell you that later, I guess, maybe. But they were recorded. So we were at one step up one night, uh, and we'd been working on this project. And the project was a group called Starguard, right? And, um, and so... One night we're in the studio. Again, I'm hanging out. I'm there with Jack Ashford and Eddie Bongo Brown and Wawa Watson and these guys, right? The Funk Brothers. And James Jameson is like three hours late. And they're paying 260 bucks an hour for, to rent this studio. And Jameson didn't show up. Everybody else is there and they're waiting to get started on the song. No James Jameson. So Leonard Jackson said to Norman, he said, Norman, why don't you let, uh, let Mark Canole get a chance playing on this song? He's pretty good. And Norman looked at me with that look, like Norman was a big dude, was like 6'5", 280 pounds, right? And all his hair. And, Man, can you play? And I was like, dude. I'm the brother that brought funk to LA in the first place. Now I'm 22 years old. My chops is full because I've been gigging straight. I can play. I know I'm I can groove. And I and I'm just out of my arrogance, just out of my 22 year old arrogance. I'm in the presence of the funk brothers and telling them I'm the one that brought funk to LA in the first place. <laughs> you should have heard the studio busted out laughing. Everybody busted out laughing. Norman said, "Man, go get your bass. I'd always kept my bass in the in the car just in case, you know. So I went and got my bass, and the and I came in tuned up. Norman said, "Let me see what you got." And the very first song I played on for Norman Whitfield was 
Which way is up? Had to get off of that merry-go-round. Which way is up? Cause I found out I was going down. And, and, and that was my groove. He didn't tell me what to play, right? He just said play, right? And I and I know I had to, you know, I had the funk in me. I know I could play it. And I funked it up, you know. And uh, he loved it, right? He loved it. So, um, and, and everybody loved it. Jack Ashford loved it. Wawa loved it. In fact, Wawa called me in on a couple of, to, to do a couple of songs with him in another studio at a different time. And I, and, I, and um, that was my very first session, right? And then, uh, um, and then uh, uh, after that, Norman had an understudy guy named Mark Davis, who was a, a songwriter and a producer. Mark had produced, um, remember the Animal House movie? Mm-hmm. The Animal House movie. Mark had produced a couple of songs on the Animal House soundtrack, and Mark had called me to come play bass on. Um, you make me want to shout, throw my hands oh, up and yeah, shout. Nice. Yeah. And I and I played on. That was my second session, and then there was another song on that session it was called Shamalama Ding Dong, from the movie. And I played on that. And it was, that was my second and third session. So right off the bat, I hit with three gold records, my first three sessions in the Norman Whitfield family. Well, and those those are so different, of course, from, you know, 70s fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so what happened was after that, Norman decided to give the other guys a try in the studio because he realized, OK, these kids can play. This kid can play. Maybe Walter is good. And Walter was a monster. And, and and Izzy in the studio. And then he got us in the studio. And prior to prior to that night, ooh, uh-oh, my foot got caught in the wire. Sorry about that. Prior to that night, wait a minute, this looks crooked. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Prior to that night, Norman had, uh, he had, uh, four bass players that he always called on all of his sessions. He always had, he'd either call Kenny Burke, if he was available, Kenny Burke, who was from the Invisible Man's band. Mm-hmm. He would call Herman Edwards, who was from LTD. Um, he'd call James Jefferson, uh, James Jamerson Sr., who was the legend, and he'd call Jamerson Jr., right? And all of these guys are fantastic bass players. All of these guys are guys that I like. Yeah, you know, I honored, I, I honor those guys. I give them guys rock, they could groove. But after that night, he called each one of them like one more time. And then after that, I ended up playing almost everything that came out of the label from 77 to 83. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, I played on most of the stuff that came out of the Whitfield family. And um, that that's kind of how I got in. You know, I came in, I came in, I came in, Barry Bonds on the bass and knocked the ball out the park. You know, my first three records were gold records. And then after that, um, I was locked in. You know, he called me for everything. And I was, I was at the studio almost every day, you know, for the next three, four years, so. Wow, that's an amazing, fantastic story, Mark. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I wanna ask you, of course, some more details about uh, Whitfield and about some of those acts. Um, Your own band, though, you guys got out some records, but they didn't really catch fire like uh, some of the other acts. What what happened with that? Did it just not get uh, promoted right or what? There are, it's always some some of this so many complex stories. So, so we started off recording our album in '77, our first album, which was the Mamatapi Monster album in uh, 1977, and um, it was um, it, it was real good music for '77, but that album didn't come out until like, I think it was maybe December 
of 81. Wow. And a lot changed. The industry changed. First of all, we uh, we started off, it was still solid in the disco era. And then something happened around 79 where the whole I hate disco movement came in. Yeah. And, you know, we call ourselves targeting that, that album for dance. But what happened for us was we didn't finish the album because when Norman found out how good we were as studio musicians, right? Me, Walter, Izzy, and Jimmy Valdez, uh, when he found out how good we were as studio musicians, he ended up keeping us in the studio almost nonstop. Mm -hmm. Where we just we never finished our album because we went right on a Spider Turner album. Then we did a Masterpiece album. Then we did a Willie Hutch album. Then we did a Rose Royce album. Then we did a, 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 a another Spider Turner album. Then we did then we played on Jeff Perry uh, Jeff Perry's album. Um, then we played on um, oh golly uh, another Rose Royce album. Then we you know and we were just Non-stop in the studio. Uh, well, we we did an Undisputed Truth album, then we did a Dream Machine album, and I mean, just we just we we were just non-stop in the studio. Especially the core. The core of the group was was Walter, me, and Izzy. In the meantime, we were trying to work on our stuff, but it wasn't a priority over over Junior Walker, Willie Hutch. Uh, I did two Willie Hutch albums. I did. Two Spider Turner albums. I did two Masterpiece albums. I did, you know, we we just kept working on other people's stuff. And finally, we didn't, we weren't able to finish our album till 1981. And by that time, the whole market had just kind of changed. You know, the whole market had kind of changed, and we would, and so we were just kind of caught. And we had some good songs on the album. But, you know, this was our first time ever in the studio, you know, and as as a group. And we just kind of got caught in the the swim of all this stuff we were doing. And of course, you hear yourself on the radio every day when Willie Hutch is playing on the radio and Spider's playing on the radio and Rose Royce is playing on the radio. And that's me playing bass, you know, and you, you kind of get excited about that and you just want to keep doing it and and we we really we we kept expecting things to get better but they never really did and when that album came out when the first album came out we had a couple of we had several songs on there that we thought could have been singles in 77 you mm -hmm. know 78 but by uh, by 81 by 81 82 we came out December of 80, 81. And, uh, and yeah, it was, it, it was, it was disappointing that we were on everybody else's albums that were hitting. And our own stuff wasn't, you know. Well, I mean, R and B and funk in particular, I mean, moved faster than maybe any other genre at that time. I mean, and, and the whole disco thing, like you said, um, wow, that's four years is like an eternity at that time musically. Yeah. Uh, it's ironic to me, Mark, as I hear you tell it, because initially Whitfield, uh, you know, decided that he didn't want you to sort of be anonymous in uh, with Undisputed Truth. But then when he heard what you could do in the studio, that kind of changed. So and yeah. you know, to be a little more anonymous. So interesting. And I, and I recognize, I mean, he, he saw us as more valuable being around laying all these tracks because for Norman, there was nothing he could sing or teach or play that I couldn't play on bass. If he thought it, I could pretty much feel what he was thinking. And I could, and I could figure out a part that would be like the groove that he wanted and I could lock it and, and, uh, and he liked having me around. 